Guys, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're super happy to see so many of you showing up on a Friday evening. Kudos to you guys. And uh, we're not going to, let's say, put your trust in demise for coming at a Friday evening here. So we have a lot of things to discuss and we hope to have a very thought-provoking conversation and discussion about post-Soviet heritage in video games by Monica and me. And um, before we will start, uh, just a few words about the Austrian Cultural Forum and um, the Polish-Japanese Academy of Information Technology, where I'm uh, located. So um, last year we started a collaboration in the field of video games on events regarding to video games and culture, design and development. And we have extended our collaboration for the next year to have further events like today, but also dig further into events in the realm of design and development, so to even have more technical talks. And even um, next month, we'll, have, uh, we'll continue our series of these events with the Austrian Game Dev Night. So we'll be starting to invite Austrian game developers who will come here, present their games. You will also have the possibility to test their games and then also um, listen to a, a professional talk by the developer at the end and also discuss with them today. But today, we're not going to talk about game development but about video games as a cultural medium and what they have to say specifically in regards to heritage. So uh, maybe Monica, you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Monica. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Warsaw. I'm working at the Faculty of Liberal Arts, uh, where I teach uh, uh, subjects related to museum and heritage studies. Uh, by uh, education, I'm an uh, art historian and archaeologist. Uh, and uh, this year, I published two books, uh, one, uh, Theorizing Archaeological Museum, Museum Studies. I published it uh, with the publishing house of uh, Rutledge. Uh, and uh, this was devoted to my doctoral uh, research on archaeological museums and, and theories that may emerge from, from, uh, from new exhibitions. And I also published uh, an edited volume on critical heritage studies. So for Polish speakers, if you are interested in, in what we're going to say uh, today in terms of theory, then you can check out out Krytyczne Studia nad Dziedzictwem, Pojęcia Metody, Teorie i Perspektywy by uh, University of Warsaw Press, so Wydawnictwa Uniwersytetu Warszawskiego. Um, yeah, I completely forgot to uh, mention that uh, I'll be speaking here today because we did this project together. We've been working for the last half year on this research and also presented it in Austria and Klagenfurt at a conference. Um, so I see a lot of people that I know, a lot of students from Piat and the Game Lab. But for those who don't know me, I'm the head of Piat Game Lab. It's a platform um, where we help students to develop their interests and uh, professions as future game designers and developers and kind of like try to connect the cultural sphere, the industry, um, with our students. And um, at the university, I work also as a lecturer, project coordinator, researcher, and a kind of an entrepreneur doing these kinds of uh, projects. So I'm kind of involved in more or less everything that has to do with video games. So usually I should just say I work with video games. And we've been working together on, on the project. And the question that drove us to start um, um, investigating uh, was a shared interest, namely, how is post-Soviet material culture presented, used, and perceived um, um, <laughs> in video games, exactly. So, and to approach this today in a more systematic way, I think Monica can introduce us to the agenda. Yes, so the agenda for today's meeting is we're going to start obviously by introduction. <laughs> this, uh, this is going to be a theoretical introduction to the concepts that we are using. So, so we we uh, we would like them to to sound so 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 they they are clear for all of us. Then I'm going to take us into a journey through critical heritage studies and uh, particularly through difficult heritage that will be the light motive or the core concept of today's meeting. And then Benji will uh, guide us through post-Soviet architecture and video games. He will he will uh, uh, tell us more about case studies uh, that we discussed. And then I will take over again. So we're gonna have a very dynamic meeting, <laughs> and I will try to answer the question, or at least pose the question, whether we're talking about difficult or 
even demonized heritage. So just uh, for starters, before Halloween parties, okay? And then <laughs> we're gonna jump to conclusions and recommendations for the future because we don't want to leave you with any particular uh, practical remarks at the end. Yeah. Well, without any practical remarks, because we want to actually encourage you and show you that there are ways to tackle that. But and after that, we'll have a Q and A where we will have an open discussion. And don't leave directly after the Q and A because we have a bit of wine prepared for you to kind of heat the debates after the um, talk. So you you're invited to stay here and have a discussion all together. So. Um, we'll start once the pointer will change the slide. There we go. Um, for those of you who have played video games in the last 20 years, some of you might recognize that screenshot from a game. Does anyone recognize the video game from where that screenshot is from? It is the original Call of Duty Modern Warfare, um, the block map from the multiplayer mode. And what is interesting about that map is that it's a representation of Chernobyl, at least what was left from it. I myself, I'm originally from Germany, and I can tell you for, and I can speak for people who have uh, grown up in, in, the, in the Western Central Europe, that this, is, this kind of representation is usually how we, what we get to see from Central Eastern Europe. This is a very common representation that is presented in media, and in games. And it is not necessarily a lie, because I've been living now here in Warsaw also for six years, and there are parts that really look like that. Maybe not in Warsaw, but the easier you go. So it is a, but the thing is that with this kind of representation and this kind of material heritage, it is a more nuanced and complex thing than just representing it as bleak, abandoned ruins. And this is at the core of our talk here today and the research that we did to investigate why this kind of representation is so common in video games, but generally uh, digital media. And before we go over to start, start about heritage and introduce some concepts, the question also that we discussed was how do we, we actually need to start at a premise. Why is it even important to discuss what happens in video games? Why does it even affect us? Why should we even care? And the thing is that because many of us spend a lot of time in video games, we are not just there, but we dwell there and we live. And the concepts that we chose to discuss this are from Bourdieu and Heidegger, habitus and dwelling. And what these concepts basically mean are that in these games, we form relationships with the environment and the characters, and in multiplayer games, even with other people. This makes these environments meaningful to us, and whatever happens in these environments um, has an effect about how we perceive these worlds, and it might reflect on how we see the reality that actually is then represented in these virtual spaces. With dwelling, it is that these video ga games, they provide us with purposes and objectives, things that we're doing there, that then also create a form of meaning and trajectory for us in the games, which again makes the, these virtual spaces in which we're dwelling and living meaningful, thus also having these representations, having a direct effect on us and how we perceive the world that they represent. And with that, I think I can give it over to Monica to introduce you to post-Soviet heritage as a concept. Yes, so, so the second concept we are using, and we want to be very clear about that, is the post-Soviet heritage. And we need to differ it from Soviet heritage. Because when we talk about Soviet heritage, we mean all immaterial and material, so all material culture and all intangible traditions uh, and also culture created in the former USSR, uh, dependent states and satellite countries between 1945 and 1990, uh, 1991. Yeah? So it would be rather like a classical, would say, his, uh, history of art question, like, for instance, uh, who designed the building, who, uh, who, who lived in the building, who, uh, uh, who used this type of architecture, and so on and so forth. Whereas when we talk about post-Soviet heritage, uh, we mean a term that actually describes the afterlife of Soviet heritage after 1991. Uh, so, so this is very important differentiation uh, because uh, we are not approaching the theme of, of today's meeting in a way uh, 
in a way that would dictate us to tell you more about the architectural styles, artistic qualities, or historical circumstances of, of this architecture but rather in a way to think about the representation of the past, about the afterlife of, of material culture in which we somehow, uh, which we somehow inhabit. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, and now I will introduce you to our theoretical framework. So as uh, Benji has already mentioned, post-Soviet architecture and games is depicted as a kind of negative heritage. This term comes from a very flourishing and very popular discipline of uh, critical heritage studies of which I am representative. And critical heritage studies is an interdisciplinary field of study that is located at the intersection of various humanistic uh, disciplines like anthropology, archaeology, art history, uh, psychology, sociology, and political studies. Uh, this promising field of study incorporates the latest perspectives from post-humanism and new materialism, and uh, the, while doing so, it offers a lot of new approaches to heritage. According to the definition that, uh, that is presented, uh, that was presented at one of the initial meetings of uh, the Association of Critical Heritage Studies, critical heritage studies encompass critical approaches to heritage, monuments, material and immaterial legacies of the past and present uh, uh, <clears throat> that emerge from an urgent need to rethink heritage. As Laura Jane Smith, the founder of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies, writes, heritage studies needs to, re to be rebuilt from the ground up, which requires the ruthless criticism of everything existing. Heritage is as much as anything a political act. And we need to ask serious questions about the power relations that heritage has all too often uh, been invoked to sustain. Nationalism, imperialism, colonialism, cultural elitism, Western triumphalism, social exclusion based on class and ethnicity, et ethnicity, and the fetishizing of expert knowledge have all exerted strong influences on how heritage is used, defined, and managed. While attempting to provide an alternative to official and traditional approaches to heritage, criti critical heritage scholars explore new methods of inquiry that challenge established conventions of positivism and quantitative analysis by including and en encouraging the collection of data from a wider range of sources in novel and imaginative ways. And this is what we're gonna do today, so I will stop here and explain you why this is, why this is even important. So traditionally, heritage studies were seen as a discipline that described and assigned values to uh, material heritage, to individual buildings or monuments, culture, art, and so on, uh, putting uh, great emphasis on art historical and architectural analysis of style and provenance, rather than on the social meaning of these sites and objects. And while we are going to explore uh, games today, it is very important to emphasize that this is the new method that is encouraged by critical heritage studies to look at the representation of material heritage and to somehow, maybe not fully reject, but somehow try to abandon these more traditional approaches that were rather limiting. And consequently, critical heritage studies actively works toward, towards democratizing heritage by consciously rejecting elite cultural narratives and embracing the heritage insights of people, communities, and players also today, and cultures that have traditionally been marginalized in formulating heritage policy. And therefore, it is also important to emphasize that the definition of heritage provided by critical heritage scholars says that heritage is a cultural and actually socio-cultural process. And it has a lot, a lot of political meaning. So this, this, is, the, this is the definition that we're going to use today. 
Additionally, crit uh, critical heritage studies seek to integrate heritage with museum studies, with st studies of memory, public history, community, tourism, planning and development. And there are also a lot of attempts to connect cr critical heritage studies with game studies. Uh, finally, critical heritage studies promote international multidisciplinary net networks and dialogues to collaborate on research and policy projects while increasing dialogue and debate between researchers, practitioners and communities. And I think this is important to stress that here we are not talking about academics and scholars that are completely detached from, from society, but this is actually like a knowledge that is uh, co-curated, co-created created even with, with uh, communities, with, with, with people who are very often more engaged in heritage than heritage experts. And finally, uh, critical heritage studies aim to make critical heritage studies truly international through a synergistic approach that takes into account diverse non-Western cultural heritage traditions. And I think uh, as we are standing today, sitting, standing, I'm standing, you're sitting, uh, <laughs> when we are based, <laughs> located here in Warsaw, it's important that actually, uh, it's important to stress that actually Central Eastern European uh, heritage is not well represented in the international debates and discussions and by bringing together these two voices from critical heritage studies and game studies, we actually aim to, to, to put some light on this region too, because it's important that it's well represented and it's also discussed. Um, yes, and Benji, if you could help me, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, uh, critical heritage studies pose very uncomfortable questions to challenge traditional views on heritage. And these traditional views are often identified as uh, authorized heritage discourse, which is a conventional way of defining and engaging with heritage. According to Laura Jane Smith, it privileges old, grand, prestigious, expert-approved sites, buildings, and artifacts facts that sustain Western narratives of nation, class, and science. Rodney Harrison, another foundational figure in critical heritage studies, connects authorized heritage discourse to the concept of canon, which was established by the 19th century Western European art historians, and uh, it's still man maintained by institutions like UNESCO and regional and national heritage bodies. Critical heritage scholars aim to present an alternative to authorized heritage discourse, which tends to prioritize the opinions of experts over the voices of society. And interestingly, it's paradoxical because officials who often uphold the authorized heritage discourse frequently claim that heritage is universal and for everyone while being expert and deciding on everything. Another term, equally important as authorized heritage discourse and even more important today, uh, introduced by critical heritage scholars, is negative or uh, difficult heritage. The originator of the concept, Lynn Meskel, defines it as a conflictual site that becomes the repository of neg negative memory in the collective imagination. <clears throat> A site of memory, negative heritage, as a site of memory, negative heritage serves a dual role. It can be mobilized for positive educational purposes. Uh, and here uh, she lists, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the museum in Auschwitz, uh, also museums uh, in, in Hiroshima, uh, the way heritage is taught in, this, uh, in District 6. Uh, or it can be erased if such places cannot be culturally uh, rehabilitated and thus resist incorporation into uh, the national identity. And she here lists uh, Nazi and Soviet statues and architecture. And interestingly, for the subject of our meeting today, Meskel exemplified negative heritage with Soviet architecture. In a similar vein, the Polish scholar Łukasz Bukowiecki has recently analyzed the, unreal, uh, the, unreal, uh, analyzed the unrealized project of a communism museum in the Palace of Culture and Science. So we uh, have here uh, something that 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 is maybe not easily erased, but it's 
easily uh, removed from public debates yes so 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 something that 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 not always uh, serves uh, educational purposes something that is I wouldn't say neglected but but it's 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 somehow put in brackets yes so 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 this would be a negative heritage that that uh, that cannot be culturally uh, rehabilitated a slightly different take on this problem was introduced with the term difficult heritage by Sharon MacDonald. In her book titled Difficult Heritage, Negotiating the Nazi Past in Nuremberg and Beyond, MacDonald defines difficult heritage as a past that is recognized uh, as meaningful in the present, but it's also contested and awkward for the public reconciliation with a positive self-affirming contemporary identity. Difficult heritage may be also troublesome because it threatens to break through, uh, 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 break through into the, the present in disruptive ways, opening up social divisions, perhaps by playing into imagined, even nightmarish futures. And this is actually uh, an example from another study that I'm working with my colleague from, from Faculty of Liberal Arts at the University of Warsaw with Gabriela Jarzembowska. She is a scholar in animals studies and we are trying to investigate the Polish state agricultural farms that many of you may know as uh, PGR. Yeah? It was a lot of them. <laughs> in, there, were, there were plenty of them in, in, in Poland. But for some reason we have only one museum uh, that, that, that is not even state funded but it's a private enterprise that documents, registers and tells the story of, of, of these, of these uh, agricultural farms that actually were a huge chunk of Polish economic uh, and social history. Also, they brought a lot of problems in the 90s when people who used to work there, live there, were just left by the state. So, so this is exactly this kind of this kind of difficult heritage uh, that may open up social divisions between these who lived in the cities and these who stayed in these in these uh, state agricultural farms and had, and had no possibilities to to start a better life after 1989 after the transformation in Poland. Um, <clears throat> And uh, if we think about the, the last sentence, especially uh, uh, difficult heritage may be also troublesome because it threatens to break through uh, into the present in disruptive ways, opening up social divisions, perhaps by playing into imagined, even nightmarish uh, futures, then certainly this is the case with post-Soviet architecture in Poland and elsewhere. And let us closely examine McDonald's definition and apply it to post-Soviet architecture. Yeah. McDonald writes about the past that is recognized as meaningful in the present. In the present. In the present, sorry. <laughs> Indeed, if we, if we consider that most of our cities are still filled with monumental architecture from the Soviet era or such modernist designs from the same period, it is hard to dispute the significance of this heritage. It has meaning because we inhabit it, passing, it uh, passing by every day on our way to work or spending our free time there. These buildings shape the reality we live in. They undoubtedly hold social meaning, but they are more than that. Some of them possess artistic qualities, some carry historical value, and some are important records of past urban planning. MacDonald goes on to say that this heritage is also contested and awkward for public reconciliation with a positive self-affirming identity. Indeed, many of us may recall the persistent calls to demolish the Palace of Culture and Science in Warsaw as a symbol of the communist regime. In fact, many buildings of exceptional artistic and historical value were erased from the city, including the Amelia Furniture Pavilion, to mention at least one example. This past is mainly contested by politicians, though. Therefore, it is, it is useful to analyze post-Soviet heritage through the framework of critical heritage studies, which, which openly acknowledges the political significance of heritage. 
When heritage is awkward for some interest groups, it becomes more vulnerable, particularly as it does not align with the positive and self-affirming identity of Poles after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The difficulty lies in, uh, in unprocessed trauma and a painful past. These aspects are addressed by the last sentence of McDonald's definition. Heritage can be troublesome because it serves a as a reminder of the past and may lead to conflicts, as it is often seen when politicians discuss the fate of certain parts of cities or their architecture. For some, preserving post-Soviet heritage is, is, seen, is, is seen as clinging to the nightmarish past rather than moving toward an idyllic future. This nightmarish and uncanny aspect of post-Soviet heritage is undoubtedly something exploited in games. And now I will pass the mic uh, to Benji so he can guide you through the exam. Thank you very much, Monica, for this uh, great start and setting the foundation to talk further about what we just seen, but now in video games. By the way, that's from a Legia Stadium game. Okay, I'm also struggling a bit. Yeah, no. There we go. <clears throat> so um, we were dealing with the topic from various perspectives. Um, we were looking at literature that was already out there. We had our own perception on how the representation of post-Soviet heritage is appearing in video games. But for me, especially having a, let's say, a long history with uh, quantitative approaches in assessing data, it was very important for me to actually ask what people think about this kind of representation because we're assuming that everyone kind of has a conflicted emotional affection when it comes to these kinds of buildings. And I would like you to take three or five seconds to look at that image and think about the emotion that you feel. You don't need to state it, just think about it. And probably many of you had negative emotions or negative thoughts when, when looking at that. Uh, we did a survey with about 60 participants um, where we asked them to look at the image and then mention one emotion that they thought of it. And it didn't matter if they were coming from the so-called West or from post-Soviet countries or other countries, most of the results were negative and had uh, words included such as sadness, depression, and um, the other chunks, so the other and neutral thoughts on that, were basically, many of them seemed negative, but from a statistical point of view, we couldn't categorize them as negative, so we just called them other, but most likely they were <laughs> negative. And there were few that were positive, because uh, as you saw, the image didn't just contain architecture, but also nature. So many of the positive answers didn't even respond to the buildings that were represented, but the nature that was around it. And of course, the question is, why is that? Why is that representation there? Is it just because people are living among them? Is it only the politics? Or has it also to do with how this kind of heritage is represented in the video games that we play and the movies that we watch? And this will concern us for the next um, segment of this presentation. So post-Soviet housing blocks in video games was a category that we focused on. As you saw, there are different kinds of material heritage from, from monuments, from... Um, uh, landmarks, but we kind of like wanted to double down on housing blocks because they're the representation of dwelling. Th these are the places that we we're, we're, we're living in. And the first, let's say, international success of a video game, including extensive use of um, post-Soviet heritage in their world building, was in uh, 2004's Half-Life 2 by Valve. Um, where they create uh, Half-Life 2 is a kind of it's a shoot it's a story-driven shooter game for those who don't know that is also an adaptation of George Orwell's 1984 so you find yourself in a repressive state and um, yeah and there you have this so-called City 17 which is the environment where this game takes place and you have as you can see above here all of these housing blocks many of them gray decrepit destroyed uh, all around. The interesting aspect also about uh, why these kinds of buildings were chosen for this particular game was because the art director of Half-Life 2, Viktor Antonov, spent 20 years of his life growing up in Bulgaria in Sofia, where he encountered many of these buildings. Um, though, of course, in Half-Life 2, we, as we will see in the next slide, it is a mix of like classical 
architecture and uh, and post-Soviet uh, architecture, but uh, this was more or less in 2004 the first time that a game sold millions in, uh, of copies and was played by millions of people and they encountered this kind of heritage on the international stage. In 2007, two games would go on to take this kind of representation to a next level, which was, as mentioned before, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, the original one, the good one, and, <laughs> and uh, Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, a Ukrainian video game, um, of which we're going to talk a bit more uh, on later. Both of these games um, have taken what was already established by Half-Life 2, and they took this to a next level. They really created a template of how to use these kinds of housing blocks in video games to what we can call negative ambient. Because these games are shooter games, they are about um, uh, uh, they are about repressive states, or they are uh, um, they are about an apocalypse or an, a, a dark post-apocalyptic scenario, as in Stalker, um, or as we will see in Daisy, a zombie apocalypse. So these ga uh, so these kinds of representations are all used to re basically um, sustain and further reinforce these kinds of uh, game genres. So in a way, one could even say they just fit to these games. And what we did with these games, we, we had a look at uh, many, many, I mean, I played these games, but together we looked also at many, many hours of gameplay footage where we took a look at these buildings and did a kind of visual analysis of all of the three games, so Half-Life 2, Stalker, and DayZ. And we came down to three categories that were um, more or less used in the, in the visual representation of uh, these buildings. Um, that are that can be um, reduced to the three categories of ruination, lighting, and color palette. This is something that reappears in all of these games and is done in a very similar way to create this very uncanny feeling and negative ambient. With ruination is that in all of these games, almost you will never find a building that is whole. All of them are ruinated, all are of them are abandoned, and if they're not abandoned, they're like in a really decrepit state. You will never find in these games a building of this ar a particular architecture that looks inhabitable. Uh, lighting is that in all of these games we have very dim light, even if it's daylight, it is clouded, it is a, it, it's dark, it's gray, and it feels kind of gloomy. And the color palette, um, there the artists make a lot of use of desaturated colors dark tones and low contrast to kind of indicate the sameness of the whole environment. So here you can see closer on this uh, screenshot from Half-Life 2 from an area where you can see again, even if the building is whole, you will see more or less like the, dec the, the decrepit state, the abandoned state of these buildings. Here even uh, the husk of the building. So the building is not inhabitable, but what remains is just like the technology, the panels that were used to create this kind of buildings. I'll get it right, I'll promise. Um, with Stalker, as I said, this is taken to a next level. With Stalker is a, is a very unique and very particular game because it was done by Ukrainian developers that and, and if you have played the game or if you have s seen the game, you can see how much the trauma of the Soviet occupation is reworked in the game. So uh, I just want to make clear that we're not saying that oh, the game should have used a way more friendly representation of these buildings. We're just stating how these buildings appear in that game. And again, we have these three aspects, so ruination, lighting, and color palette, done even more extreme than we saw in Half-Life 2, because in, in Stalker, we have even an approach um, a la uh, Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness, where the further you advance in the game, the more weird it becomes, the darker it becomes, the more decrepit it becomes. And it's done uh, really brilliantly in the game, in a way. But at the same time, of course, also reinforcing like the stereotype that in Ukraine or that in Central Eastern Europe, this is how people live or this is how people used to live. I mean, compare this with how we think about the ruins of ancient Greece or ancient Rome, right? If we talk about the ruins of Central, Europe, uh, of Central Europe, we do definitely not have the same kinds of emotions. So the last example um, that we'll be looking at is DayZ. Um, DayZ is a... Is a online multiplayer um, shooter zombie apocalypse game where your goal is basically survival. So 
again, you can see that the genre fits the, the use of the, of the environment or the world building. Um, also, the developers are from the Czech Republic. It's Bohemia Interactive, uh, known for Arma 3 and the other Arma titles, obviously. The only difference that, he, um, uh, that you can see is, has to do with the day and night cycle in the game, because the other games are single-player games where you spend a significant amount of playing, and that's about it. Daisy is a multiplayer game where basically there is no end. You can play endlessly. This is why the developers made the day and night cycle more contrasted, so that the, during day it wouldn't seem that depressed. So they used um, more um, saturated color to more or less allow players to spend more time uh, playing the game. And another interesting aspect was that these buildings, so these, um, these housing blocks, are one of the only areas in the game where no loot drops. Which means that these areas in the, ga in the game, you can usually find items that you can pick up and use and equip or other resources. But specifically in these buildings, these things never appear. There is nothing inside and the developers have no, did in terms of game design, gave you no intention to spend more time in these buildings, kind of like intensifying the kind of, you know, the horror of these kinds of buildings and their representation. As you can see here again, a very sameness, a bleakness, a bit with the, with the sunlight, goes down a bit better than in the other games, but still kind of a very, very bleak representation. Now, DayZ was uh, released in 2012 or 2013, and since then many more games have been um, published. Um, the games that I presented are triple A games or, or double A games, so games that, um, that are blockbuster titles and bigger. But since then, more and more indie studios have picked up on the aesthetics uh, and ha have kind of tried to rework it um, with kind of added, like turning the horror that we saw in the previous games into a kind of nostalgia trip. Or um, you trying experimenting with different uh, representations and different genres, like in city builders, um, here we have a walking simulator, and here, uh, if you know um, Taxi, um, uh, um, the, I don't, the, the arcade game, um, crazy, taxi. crazy Taxi it is, thank you very much. This is an adaptation of Crazy Taxi in uh, Soviet Serbia, it's a very interesting game. Um, however, what all of these games still fail to do, even though they try different ways in, in you know, uh, in terms of game design, is that they all use the same models. These are all the same kind of building blocks that we've seen in the other games. They never try to... Um, I mean, in Warsaw you have many examples of different architectural experimentations with this kind of architecture, but we never see anything of these. We always see the same blocks. And uh, now I will give it over to, to Monica to talk a bit more about the technology behind that, but we will be returning uh, to the reason why these kinds of housing blocks appear in all indie games. Cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, as you as you saw, post-Soviet heritage is uh, often utilized to 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 create this uncanny uh, atmosphere and apocalyptic ambience. However, it would be an overstatement to claim that these buildings represent a genuine example of uh, Eastern Bloc architecture, of Eastern Bloc heritage, and in in agreement with uh, uh, that that. These representations actually um, <clears throat> are fair to, to heritage from, from Eastern Bloc. They are in fact typical examples of large panel system building that we know in Polish as Wielka Pueta. Yes. So if you if you if you ever saw, and I think you saw <laughs> many of these blocks, then you can truly recognize them in, in the games. And the, these large panel systems, uh, system buildings were not actually a style, but a technology that was introduced by modernists in the 30s of, of the 20th century in Germany and uh, in the Netherlands. And they became po uh, very popular in uh, Soviet countries, satellite countries and dependent states uh, because they allowed for quick and very cost-effective uh, construction. And these buildings do age poorly. 
we know that yes <laughs> if you if you walk in like yeah even in warsaw but but uh, obviously outside warsaw especially 10 15 or 20 years ago but no probably 20 years ago not many of you could go outside but but some of us yeah uh, some of us saw saw it so 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 they looked very bad and uh, our first intuition was that game producers capitalize on this eerie and alienating effects uh, 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 these uh, old buildings, uh, aging buildings, uh, create. They are often depicted, uh, depicted in dark colors, as Benji said, uh, without proper contrast, uh, with rainy or foggy weather, typically in the evening or at night, evoking very unpleasant and very negative feelings. Additional elements that you saw on the screens that Benji showed us like destroyed fences, abandoned cars, they even further contribute to this, to this very dark and very gothic uh, impression. And the so-called uh, so post-Soviet heritage in video games represents then, in fact, a technology popular during Soviet times rather than the officially accepted architectural styles. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, no, too far. Okay. And the prevailing styles during the, uh, the, the, the communist times, during the Polish People's Republic, were social realism and uh, socialist modernism or sots modernism. Social, real, uh, social realism uh, that was officially declared as the dominant style for all of the arts, uh, sculpture, painting, architecture, everything, uh, it was introduced by an official uh, decree of Stalin in the 30s and of course as the as the USSR progressed to the west and to the to the south uh, um, and to all, actually all the directions uh, then of course dependent states uh, and satellite countries were of course obligated to to sign uh, to to accept the uh, decree uh, and um, <clears throat> the most uh, i would say remarkable examples of socialist realism uh, are of course Palace of Culture and Science. Uh, this is why it was so often um, uh, it was so often uh, uh, called by politicians to 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 demolish it. Another uh, good example would be uh, Platz Constituti, uh, also excellent, excellent, actually excellent type of architecture with especially with these lanterns. They are like big dominants there. But yeah, this is like pure socialist realism. Uh, we could also even add the, the street that you probably took to, to get here. So Marszałkowska Street would be partly at least, at least partly in terms of urban planning uh, would uh, still fit to socialist realism. Uh, but the second, the second style that was popular back then and is, is actually extremely popular now in the media is socialist modernism or sots modernism, um, which was a functionalist and modernist type of architecture that was created by the earlier avant-garde architects. Uh, and uh, here we can mention architects who actually uh, who actually studied uh, uh, very often studied uh, uh, outside of Poland. Uh, there are some examples, even like one example, a very famous architect uh, who, who studied uh, under the supervision of Le Corbusier. Uh, we had uh, a lot, a lot of very progressive, very innovative architects uh, who collaborated, who were very interested in innovation. They held meetings outside of Poland uh, with uh, some colleagues from, from Eastern Bloc, but also from the, from the Western countries. So, uh, so, so this is very important that they needed to found uh, find themselves uh, themselves with a new political realities and uh, some somehow conformed uh, to the political situation and uh, therefore their projects were were uh, uh, were put into fruition and we can see a lot of architecture that is inspired by by experiments that uses a lot of new technologies and techniques and even techniques that we cannot copy and reconstruct today. The best example of uh, how we cannot do this as good as they did it is 
of course, this one. So the Rotunda building that was terribly reconstructed just a few years ago, yes, because the architects weren't able to, to uh, reconstruct the technique they, they knew the materials, but they didn't know how to, how to do it in a way it was done in the past. And uh, if, we, if we are talking about socialist modernism, we have a lot of examples that you probably know, uh, that you pass every day, that you use maybe somehow. So uh, there, is, there is Rotunda, there are like uh, train stations, for instance, uh, uh, the, the, the main uh, line of Warsaw, which consists of, of Zahar, Chodnia, Ochota, uh, Śródmieście, Powiśle, Stadion and, and Wschodnia. Uh, so, so um, uh, of course, Zachodnia and Wschodnia uh, are now uh, remodeled, but, but you can see uh, the excellent type of this very innovative architecture with Powiśle or Stadion or, or Ochota. Uh, <clears throat> other examples would be architecture, for instance, in, in Powiśle, where we have the X buildings. There are three X buildings. Um, and there, are, there are also there is the Puma building or the, the Hammer building uh, at Smolna. So, so many, many excellent examples. Some of them are also gone, uh, gone like the furniture pavilion Emilia that was close by. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but but some of them uh, are still still here, and uh, what is important here is that socialist modernism was attempting to fulfill cultural utilitarian econo and economic requirements. Uh, the, here, uh, the architectural statement was that form should follow function, and even though uh, the architects used uh, mass-produced materials and uh, sometimes applied into industrial aesthetics. Uh, there was a clear uh, idea of the shapes of the buildings uh, uh, that were also coexisting uh, with other forms of architecture and within uh, the landscape. And nowadays, it is uh, no wonder why a socialist modernism enjoys a great, great popularity that is illustrated by Instagram profiles, uh, the ones related to brutalism, to uh, social modernism, so Soviet modernism. There was even a profile, uh, the, the most famous one, that, that actually started as an Instagram profile but ended as a book series. Uh, so, so there are like these publications. Uh, a lot of books. Um, you can show the second slide. Yeah, exactly, thank you. There are a lot of books, uh, for instance, The Modern Forms uh, by Nicolas Grospierre. Uh, so excellent photographs, very, 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 uh, very good, uh, a very good approach to, to this kind of architecture. And, uh, and what is, I think, the most important in terms of our topic and the definition of heritage that I presented earlier, we have a lot of activist groups that are, that are vouching for this kind of heritage. So, for instance, my favorite is Tubuo Tu Stawo, uh, which, uh, uh, which, is a, which is a group of, of, uh, of people who, uh, uh, who, for instance, initiated the social archive of, of Warsaw, where you can send, submit photos, archival photos of, of buildings that are not, no, uh, uh, no longer in Warsaw, that were demolished. But also of buildings uh, in the past that that uh, still that are still standing. Uh, uh, there are a lot of projects. There are a lot of initiatives uh, that they are organizing. Um, they also created this interactive map where you can see heritage that was removed and heritage that is still there and heritage that is endangered. So so the most important aspect is that here we are not. Um, dealing with only experts who are deciding, uh, arbitrarily deciding upon heritage, but we are actually talking about people, people like us here, who are interested in the surrounding that they, they, that they inhabit. So, uh, so, uh, so, so this, is, this, is, this is really, really important. And 
If we go back now to, uh, to our main topic, so heritage and video games, then we need to sadly say that this fascination is completely ignored in the video games. Uh, video games that tend to focus on the large panel system buildings instead of showcasing what was remarkable and in fact to a large extent also shaped the Soviet heritage scape. In comparison to historical games like the Assassin's Creed series, for instance, which depict what is exceptional and unique for certain historical times, Soviet-themed uh, games focus on something unwanted, shameful, and mundane. And even the visual effects make it, make it more visible, more, more, I would say, more direct. Uh, why then? The producers of Assassin's Creed did not depict French villages in Provence, but instead showed Paris during the revolution time. Or why do we look at the greatest period of Greek democracy with incredible Parthenon instead of looking at the Greek lands when they were under the Ottoman uh, rule? While these questions are obviously rhetorical, they highlight the difference in representation be between Soviet architecture and, histori and other historical settings. Reducing the representation of post-Soviet heritage to large panel system buildings make all the, makes all the built architecture from the Soviet time appear depressing, unlivable, and even inhumane. This categorizes it as negative heritage, as Lynn Meskel described it. Presented this way, it cannot be culturally rehabilitated and thus resists incorporation into the national imagery. However, is it truly that negative? <laughs> Compared to the current standards of housing block constructions that were recently referred as to pathological development, you may know it in Polish, it was uh, pathodeveloperka, it was recently published by Łukasz Drozda. Uh, so this is, uh, this, is, this is our point of reference now. If we compare these, uh, this, these, this kind of design, this kind of urban planning with what we know now as Patodeveloperka, these settlements provided ample space, greenery, infrastructure, and connectivity with other parts of the city. Extensive research conducted by many Polish architectural historians, like for instance Ola Kędziorek or Ala Gzowska, has demonstrated that these settlements were very well planned and highly functional in comparison to, to today's not very functional, like these micro, micro apartments that you probably saw on many memes. This is something, yeah, this is something that changed for bad, <laughs> I would say. So many, still, many who still live in, in places like Sade Żoliborskie, Okrąg Settlement or Ursynów can confirm this, that these were actually highly functional, very well planned and very humane architectural forms. Perhaps this is what is negative about this kind of heritage, uh, the, this kind of realization that in many ways it was more humane under far more challenging political and historical circumstances. This subversive thought is challenging to, the, to reconcile after Poland's reinvention post-1989. And when discussing negative heritage, Len, Lynn Meska suggested that it can be harnessed for positive educational purposes and help in reworking the trauma of the past. While many, uh, many bottom-up initiatives actively work to rehabilitate post-Soviet and socialist heritage, one could wonder if the game industry could play a supportive role in this effort. And maybe Benji will answer this question. <laughs> Yeah, well, we try to answer the question together. I'll just have a very quick sip of water. <clears throat> okay. So we will, we were returning basically to the question that we started here today. So how is post-Soviet material culture used in video games and perceived by players? And though some of the criticism is right, we just want to make clear that we're not criticizing the games that we presented here today. Um, so Half-Life 2, DayZ, and... Uh, and Stalker are amazing games and amazing proof of great game design. So we're not criticizing them for, for making use of that. What we're saying is that there are more dimensions of this form of representations that should be looked at. 
And one of these perspectives that helps us to understand why this kind of representation occurs is you could, of course, say, yeah, they, this, this kind of representation fits the genre of shooters and horror. But the thing is that there is way more to it. Actually, um, if you look at the production of video games, and there is a field called production studies, which is forwarded by the Czech, um, by the Czech scholar Jan Svelch, is that especially if you look at um, Eastern or Central Eastern European video games, um, you see that over 95% of the games created in Poland, but also Central Eastern Europe, are exported to the West. They are created for a Western audience, which already creates a target audience that expects a certain kind of representation. So the audience for the games um, the, for, for them, uh, that is created for this, uh, for this audience is already created because they're used to this kind of representation and it reproduces more or less this kind of stereotype. Another thing, and this is what I meant with the cliffhanger to the indie video games, is that time and budget is always at stake in the development of video games, especially for smaller enterprises. So what you want to do is um, save time and save resources. So what you do often is to use assets that have been already created um, and reuse them for your game. So for those who do not know what assets are in video game development, these, are, they, these can be, for example, 3D models that can be either purchased or downloaded for free and used under certain licenses in your video game. Now the thing, as I said, most indie, video ga uh, indie developers, they don't have the time and they don't have the money to create everything themselves. So, so they usually focus on important gameplay elements um, instead of the details of, let's say, fantastic socialist modernist architecture in the video game, which would be great, of course. But instead, they will look into the Steam Workshop or the Unity Asset Store or the Blender Market or the Unreal Engine Marketplace and what you will find, if you will be looking for post-Soviet uh, housing blocks, are always these kinds of models. Either decrepit, in really bad states, these models, or this, again, the sameness of these um, block buildings. You never, or seldomly, very seldomly, there are a few exceptions, but you very seldomly find any other examples which contributes basically to the whole reproduction of the same kind of representation over and over. So it is not just the genre that determines this kind of representation, but it's obviously a production loophole that causes this representation just to repeat because it's just a cheap solution for indie developers. And I'm not criticizing the indie developers here because, well, every, anyone who knows something about game development, it's a tough job. Um, so, however, it doesn't mean that there isn't a way out of it. Like, what I always like to crown myself with is that I'm always interested in pragmatic and practical solutions to problems. So if one of the problems goes down to that there are just too many 3D models in that kind of fashion, maybe a solution, oh, wrong direction, maybe a solution would be to create 3D models based on this kind of innovative, progressive kind of architecture to diversify the architectural landscape in these video games. All of these buildings are everywhere, for example, in Poland, not just in Warsaw, but in Katowice, in Wrocław, in other, in other um, uh, post-Soviet countries. They're all around, not just building blocks, but different kind of ar architecture. But they're also often like in very decrepit states, and they receive more attention to be preserved, to be then used by, by maybe designers or um, developers to be included. So what, what our proposition is, as we said at the beginning, we didn't want to just like, you know, invent a problem and then let you discuss about the problem, but to also show that there are solutions. What we thought of is that, that the creation of public asset packs of very unique and significant Soviet architecture would be a way to tackle this. Of course, there are more issues connected to copyright and all of that, but I do think that the idea would work and promote it among local designers to kind of use in their video games, but maybe even having a whole game jam around the topic and encourage the use of these assets in the video games. So that instead of imposing this kind of architecture on game developers, encouraging developers to use it and have like a grassroots uh, movement to use these kinds of assets. So if any of you students are interested in doing that, we'll be happy to support you <laughs> in any way possible. 
um, especially as we see we have students from different faculties, different universities, so get together, think about a project and let us know. Okay. There we go. Sometimes you need a bit brute force. So, and with that, we're reaching the end of our presentation here today, and we had a couple, I think we all are getting out here of our own kind of conclusions, but we at least, we came up with the following ones, and maybe Monica can refer, refer first to the more, um, well, related to heritage, don't fall down. Yes, yeah, so, so if, we, uh, if we are about to conclude, I would say that, <clears throat> that obvious conclusion is that post-Soviet heritage in games remains very one-dimensional and reproduces stereotypes. As we saw, like, there, there, is, there, is, uh, there are not uh, easy solutions to this situation, and situation that actually affects how we think, how we dwell uh, in, uh, in this surrounding and how it is promoted outside, yeah? So, 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 so the worst, I think, the, 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 the saddest conclusion out of this study is that actually we live within this this space, and it doesn't look that bad <laughs> as it as it looks in the games. And given that that this is how uh, um, uh, former uh, Eastern Bloc countries are represented outside, it might affect, of course, tourism, heritage, uh, uh, heritage uh, tourism, uh, also like you know general reception of these these countries and their popularity in a way as uh, tourism destinations uh, for sure uh, it may also uh, it may also challenge uh, uh, maybe also challenging for for people who travel here and maybe ex uh, 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 expect to to see some some uh, some scenarios and, and, <laughs> and actually scenographies from stalker and they don't see it because Warsaw looks like Warsaw uh, and the, the second conclusion would be that socialist modernist uh, so socialist modernism uh, modernist housing just Generally, architecture uh, in video games uh, is not presented. Is, is actually uh, what we see is is not even the style, but but uh, but the technology. So so we don't see the exact uh, you know ideas that were brilliant. Yes, and and. We usually, when we talk about uh, games and and the environments that they reconstruct, we, we we talk about something that is that is interesting, that it's that it's unique, that it's exceptional. Yeah, and here here we don't even see this kind of architecture because we don't see architecture. What we see is a technology. So um, so I think that. Given the social uh, interest in in uh, so modernism, so socialist modernism, given the popularity of this heritage in this material and social context, uh, I think it, it's high time to 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 somehow challenge what what is being uh, served in the in the digital realm. Yeah, especially as challenges can always um, well spark spark innovation, spark creativity. And um, referring to kind of like the, a possible alternative or solution to it would be is of course we can, we can give explanations why this representation is happening because of the genre of the video game, because of orientalism or because of stereotypes and representation. But these are not necessarily explanations that help us to find solutions. Um, what, what helps us to find solutions is to look at how video games are produced and find loopholes that can be tackled, like with, uh, you know, um, helping to create better representations in 3D models, for example. Um, you know, if you would ask me, I'm pretty sure there could be like any kinds of um, governmental funding for these kind of projects, especially with the new upcoming government. I think so. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so basically, this, this is the kind of. Um, uh, like a, a proposition that, that that can be done to kind of like change the representation and in 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 this very context being here in Warsaw also like the representation of Warsaw and Poland on the public stage and with that before I'll end again um, big thanks to the Austrian Cultural Forum for hosting us here and hosting the future events um, you should definitely follow them on Facebook where you can be informed on all of these events happening but we will be also posting the links to their uh, to their web page and everything and everything game lab related so you will always find them there will be wine soon but before that we'll still have a Q&A and thank you very much for your attention thank you thank you
uh, English or Polish? Maybe English, since I think. Okay, as sure. Let me introduce myself. My name is Grzegorz Mika. Actually, I'm an architect and I research history of architecture of Warsaw. And actually, I enjoy playing games like uh, City Skylines or, work sure. or Workshop uh, or Workers and Resources, which was actually mentioned, but only mentioned unfortunately, because actually it's one of the most recent and actually most successful attempts at recreating something more than just decrepit post-Soviet landscape. Mm -hmm. And mo most of the things that you mentioned, like availability of assets for free that are used in the games, are actually already available, like for example for city skylines or for workers and resources. And uh, this very game is actually well, open coded and people mud it and mm. build assets and most recognizable objects like, for example, Constitution Square, for example, the corns from Katowice, the not existing Katowice train station, Warsaw train station, Palace of Culture are already available and can be downloaded and are widely used by many different users. And one more thing uh, uh, about, uh, about uh, the building uh, models and uh, being it's sponsored by the government. From what I have heard from Ministry of Culture, uh, there were already uh, certain like projects underway dedicated to building 3D models of uh, modernist architecture. So that's that, and I recommend workers and resources mm. because it's a very good strategy uh, for building cities and economical, and actually tries to recreate economical aspects of socialism besides architecture. Yeah, I'll just respond to that. Thank you very much for that contribution. It, it is indeed a great game, and I'll respond to that. Um, since you mentioned that these assets can be also downloaded, the thing is that that um, you're referring to the mod, um, to the modder um, community, which is out there. But uh, us usually, most players that encounter this kind of representation are not modders, or also are not that um, are not developers. So the thing is that, and and, and the game itself, uh, even though it was successful and is widely widely used and has an active community, is of course not what most people still associate with. Also. Um, with, with, with that game, there's a stronger emphasis on the creation of industry also, but of course with the modding culture you have people who introduce to, you know, upload their creations, but still um, this remains like in a smaller um, modern scene. And um, also to the aspect of the um, project, the funded projects, of course it's not enough to do a project, oh let's do some 3D models about uh, uh, corn building in Katowice, but what is way more important is that how can these models then also be made accessible to designers and developers on a wider scale? So yeah, it isn't, they, I'm not saying that there haven't been attempts, but definitely um, there need to be more efficient attempts. At least this is the, the thing. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, hi. Um, so I would say the global political landscape is experiencing a US-driven like right-wing backlash, so anything left-wing, including socialism, communism, and similar concepts are very demonized. So what I was thinking is, wouldn't you agree that the lack of sort of this grand monumental socialist architecture and any like cultural you know, paraphernalia, objects, know, texts of culture or anything like that, the omittance of that in, in video games might be somehow uh, connected to the attempt to maybe prevent accusations of glorifying uh, a, to a totalitarian state or totalitarian ideology, because uh, what I would say is uh, maybe the developers are somehow maybe frightened uh, of those accusations and just try to stick to, you know, tried and tested um, imagery so that, you know, no accusations would be uh, thrown their way. Thank you. This is a, an excellent question. I, I mean, like, I'm not a specialist in game studies, but I can definitely address this issue from heritage angle. And uh, I remember. <clears throat> 
during one of my research days uh, in the US, I talked to, to my professor who in the past supervised a PhD student who wanted to do, uh, to, to, to do um, archaeology of, of, uh, of uh, like Soviet archaeology in a way. Like it was still uh, the beginning of the 90s, something called archaeology of contemporary past was completely new. Like there were only a few scholars that were like, you know, doing some kind of urbex stuff, not really regular research. And this uh, this guy who is now a professor, v Victor Buchli, uh, he couldn't find the job in the US because of his topic, because uh, of his work being read in this kind of uh, terms, uh, like, you know, this kind of, 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 of Western triumphalism that hates like leftism and, and so on. I think he is based uh, in European, uh, one of the Europeans, uh, European institutions right now. And I think in the 80s, 90s, uh, there was a lot of reservation even about talking, uh, uh, even to, to talking about about certain ideas that were here. So, so I mean, like my intuition says that s somehow it suggests that that it could be the the reason that it could be re the reason that that especially American developers and and as uh, and as the the games are targeted to the Western market that. It might be this this thing, but this this would demand further investigation. I, I don't know whether it would methodologically possible, but it's definitely interesting to pose this question. Yeah, some of you um, who are accustomed to video games might have expected today me to mention Atomic Hearts, which is a game that represents um, like um, it's an adaptation of the game Bioshock, and it represents like the 50s in Soviet Russia as like this kind of glorified fantasy. Obviously, um, I think you're on the right track with that thought that many developers, especially after the war on Ukraine, um, have like a very, let's say, um, it is a political stance also to decide what kind of representation you're using in your video game. Like, especially if you're an artist and uh, you see yourself in the art that you're creating, that you're developing, you will be careful with what you, you know, put in there. And especially if we're talking about big business, so international game companies, they don't want to be caught up with that, obviously. Um, so yet, yeah, it is obviously a very political topic and it will be very difficult to kind of, you know, for developers to put out things and be like, but I'm, you know, in a nuanced way without being criticized. But I guess sometimes it demands people to be brave and to do the first step um, for the right reasons, hopefully. Um, but I think this is a development um, that we will see happening more, moreover especially over the next years, as we already saw, there have been experimentation with this kind of trope and theme, um, and we will see further experimentation on that. Thank you. Um, I only want to say that it's a bit ironic how um, the assets, the Soviet building uh, assets are used for the same reason um, Okay, sorry. For the same reason, um, actual uh, Soviet buildings were built uh, from the um, large panels because it was cheaper, easier, and uh, ready. And also, I wanted to point, point out that um, the um, Valve's Half-Life 2, uh, I mean, you can't compare it to Stalker because it is uh, from a Ukrainian um, um, like uh, developers, so like uh, those buildings, uh, it's what they saw throughout their whole lives. Um, the um, Half-Life 2 is based on stereotypes, so mm. it's a bit, it's a different case. Mm. Uh, yes and no, because um, uh, since the art director of Half-Life 2 was himself a Bulgarian, and who grew up in Sofia and was encountering this kind of architecture. But uh, what you're right with is that obviously in Stalker we have a representation of real Ukraine. Uh, city 17 is a fictional city that uses these stereotypes in a patchwork manner. We can trace back these stereotypes and these games are comparable because Stalker builds upon this kind of representation, but it's not like they're equal in that sense. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay, <laughs> we can walk. Uh, I have a quite of an unusual question, but what came to my mind is that what do you think will happen to the 
post-apocalyptic games, where would they move to? Because they need to have a location, right? And right now the default is right the uh, uh, Middle Eastern Europe. And uh, do, do you do you think that this would change if we started to portray it more in a neutral way? And where would it move to then? Would it be like more futuristic, post-apocalyptic -apo stuff, or some other area? Perhaps the areas that are now facing some war and destruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a very interesting question. Uh, we also like we're discussing. I think um, the, the the thing is that, and this is what I always like to highlight: we're not opting to say that this kind of representation, visible in games like Stalker and Daisy, should disappear. This would be censorship because it does reflect a reality. It, especially in the case of Stalker, it does reflect trauma that happened. And it's important to have this kind of representation. What we're basically just saying is that there is a different dimension that can be done for different kinds of games and so on. But to the question where, I don't know, maybe from an art historian's perspective, where would be the next post-apocalyptic scenario? Oh, there are a lot of locations I would see. For sure, I would see Detroit and, and, uh, and American City. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. This would be my second second name. I mean, like generally, like uh, like these late capitalist uh, cities. Uh, I would also uh, like to point out that my first first uh, idea uh, when when I heard your question was actually, uh, you know, putting some light on on how the climate change will affect uh, soon uh, global uh, south. Yeah. So, so maybe this would be a mean of raising awareness in this case. Uh, we have also like a lot of conflict zones and uh, maybe uh, I don't want to <clears throat> risk here like this kind of tokenization of, of someone's suffering and so on, but, but you know, sometimes this kind of representations also, if they are properly contextualized, as with all heritage and all kinds of you know, usage, uh, uses of heritage, they may bring awareness. Uh, about certain problems. So I think uh, this week, actually, I participated in an excellent PhD defense that took place at the Faculty of Philosoph uh, Philosophy at the University of Warsaw. And it talked about uh, the representation of, of, of catastrophe of post-apocalyptic post, uh, settings within contemporary art. And what was clear for me was that the author, uh, Agata Kowalewska, she was, uh, she was Sure, she was very aware of the fact that if you employ this kind of aesthetics, you can raise awareness to really global important problems. And I think it's not the problem of this kind of aesthetics, of apocalyptic aesthetics, but how it's rooted in a certain place and, and actually does not really uh, uh, move to, 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 to present like various apocalypses. And that we are, then, and this is what we are. Uh, facing right now. Resident Evil 6 also, I think, takes place in Africa or 5. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so one place that came to my mind as well was the Chinese mega projects, like the big, big cities built and absolutely empty still. Like um, uh, if we would like to have a dystopian environment in an authoritarian country. Uh, but yeah, my thought that uh, I wanted to, to tell you, maybe an idea to put into uh, the context of the um, difficult heritage. Me, being a Scandinavist, it is difficult not to draw a parallel with a similar, kind of similar uh, heritage that we have in Sweden, uh, which is a functionalist architecture built in the roughly same uh, time period. Uh, it is called Million Programmet, uh, meaning a million program. Uh, it was a governmental initiative to build, like, um, the goal was to build a million new um, apartments for uh, the growing population after the war uh, in Sweden. But uh, the problem with this kind of architecture is on the one side, uh, the functionalist style is m mostly glorified in Sweden. Like, we have books as um, functionalism, the style that built uh, the modern nation. Like, this is the default uh, architectural style in the north and uh, in Sweden in particular. But on the other hand, this um, suburban, mostly, uh, 
places um, with the style of uh, buildings, uh, housing blocks, are now associated with uh, immigrants, with uh, poorer part of uh, the Swedish society, uh, with people so-called new Swedes, so first or second generation immigrants. Uh, these are not good addresses uh, no longer. So I wonder if we could also look what they are doing with this kind of heritage. If it is uh, present uh, in the games made in Sweden, I think Swedes are pretty big in the industry, uh, if I'm right. So it would be interesting to see um, at what they are doing and what this kind of uh, heritage, how they are handling uh, it uh, in comparison to, uh, to our uh, post-Soviet heritage. Thank you, but this is just another uh, good argument for, for how this stigmatization is, is further uh, uh, intensified, yes? That, that uh, like, it's not only the representation in the game, but the associations that may that may pop up, uh, yeah, when when uh, when certain groups are are living somewhere, and this is this is terrible. Then this is this is something that should be really addressed, uh, both by by I think heritage scholars, but but also by communities like gro bigger groups of communities within communities. Hmm. Maybe we should ask uh, more questions, or maybe you would like do to. Move? Yeah. What does what does the what does the clock tell us? Okay, maybe we, maybe we will have time for one question. Yeah, but I mean, like, we, we, we'll be still here. We'll be still here, and we'll have wine and like. <laughs> so so maybe we'll have one last question to close it. But we can on. <laughs> but, um, or you know what? No, we'll, we'll do it fair. We we will. I think the best way, is especially in regarding to the time for everyone, we will be moving to the discussion with everyone here, and we will be um, still here. So if you have questions, please approach us. And again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us here and um, yeah, giving us your time and your input on that. And we'd really like to discuss this further with you. And again, big thanks to the Austrian Cultural Forum. And please, please make sure to check out the next events that will be happening. The next one will be in November. If you need any accounts that you need to be led to, let me know. And yeah, thank you very much all for joining. All right.